I've only been back in the U.S. for the past four days. And when I got back, the first person I went to go see was my grandmother. See, my grandmother's 92 years old, and she helped raise me. And flying into JFK, I then drove out to Glen Cove, where I'm from, and I go up to my grandmother's door, and I'm knocking on the door. And my mother answers the door, and she says, oh, Jeff, you're back. I give her a massive hug and a kiss. Mom, I love you. I then see my father. Big man, you're back. I give him a hug. And then I see my grandmother sitting down. She's 92. She's very old. And my mother yells over to her, Ma, Ma, look, Jeff's back. And she looks up and she says, Jeff, you said you come back. And I knew you would. And I run over to her and I give her a massive hug. Grandma, I love you. Grandma, great to see you. She says, Jeff, calm down. I just saw you yesterday on Skippy. <laughs> I, said, I said, Grandma, no, 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 Grandma, I'm here today. See, she's 92. I thought she was having like a senior moment, right? I said, Grandma, you just saw me. Oh, wait, Grandma, do you mean when we would Skype on Mom's iPhone, when we would communicate through Skype? When I was in India, she's like, yeah, I just saw you. And I'm like, so wait, you don't miss me? <laughs> she said, oh, but I just saw you. You see, for me, for us, Skype is a technological innovation that improves the way we communicate with people of different ages and different time zones. But for my grandmother, Skype was a miracle. And I was ready, and, and I was ready for TEDx on the flight back. I'm going through my points. I'm on, it's me, my fiance, and our two amazing cats on the plane. So I was really able to focus very well, right, as they were meowing constantly, nonstop for 16 hours. And so as they were doing that, I picked up a copy of one of my favorite magazines, Fast Company magazine. And I'm reading through some of the top innovative companies of 2015. And they were all amazing, but one that really stood out to me was a company that's creating the exoskeleton. As you might know, the exoskeleton is an external medical device that helps people who are paralyzed or have no power in various limbs get that power back. It walks for them. It balances for them. And it improves the blood flow in various areas of their body. The goal of the exoskeleton is to completely replace wheelchairs in the coming years as a more effective, a more efficient way of keeping injured people mobile. Completely powerful and transformative innovation, but to its wearers, to its users, and to the family and friends of its wearers and its users. It's a miracle. I then looked at Lockheed Martin's innovation where they put a control module into these military trucks and the goal of this module is to take combat drivers off the field so that there's less people on the field but yet the soldiers can still get their supplies, their medicals, their weaponry, whatever it is they may need. But to the soldier who's face down in the dirt needing supplies and sees that truck coming over the horizon, it's much more than an innovation. It's a miracle. And when I define miracle, when I say miracle, I'm looking at Oxford Dictionary's definition of a miracle being something that is highly unlikely, improbable, an extraordinary event, an achievement that all three of these innovations are. They might seem commonplace now, Skype, or as my grandmother calls it, Skippy, that might be commonplace now. But just a few years ago, it wasn't even on the radar as a possibility. And I came to the conclusion that innovation is much more than just finding a more effective process. Innovation is much more than just the application of new ideas. That innovation, when it's done at its highest level, over time, when you put the work in, it creates miracles. But I still think we need to dig a little bit deeper. I don't think the conversation should stop there. 
Because a lot of times when we think about innovation, we think of things from the outside coming in. We think of external technology, energy. We don't think about what goes on within. We think of more effective processes to lead an organization. But what about a more effective process to lead ourselves? For us to become the best version we can be, what happens if we innovated ourselves with new ideas and new insights from our own lives? And I call that personal innovation. And I believe that when we personally innovate ourselves and we become who we're truly capable of being with the work that we put in, we can live our miracles. See, I believe that we already, at this moment in time, already are a miracle. I did some research online about what's the probability of even being here, right? What is the probability? And the researchers, the scientists, crunched some numbers, right? And they said that the odds of you being here, not winning the lotto, are one and four trillion of you being here at this very moment in time in the wonderful city that Rapid City is right here in South Dakota or New York, Glen Cove, or wherever you are. One in four trillion. Why? Why is that number so high? Because each one of us represents a link to life that goes back a hundred thousand generations. See, a lot of times when we wake up, when we go to work, when we talk to our kids, our spouse, our colleagues, we're just so caught up in the day, we completely lost fact that us even being here represents an unbroken link to life. And so I wanted to dig a little deeper, right? See, what else, what other information could I find? And I found something from Dr. Ali Benazar, who's a Harvard graduate. And he calculated, he included in this, the calculation of our parents even meeting, our parents staying together long enough to reproduce the right egg and sperm combination, natural disasters, war, disease. And his number dwarfs this one to one in 10 to the 2,685,000 that you would be here right now in this moment with that tiny little piece of spinach in your tooth that your friend didn't tell you to take out but they should have told you to take out right here in this moment. And I know you could be thinking, you know, Jeff, but this happens every day. Babies are born every day. UNICEF reports that over 350,000 babies are born per day. I lived in India for two years. They have the second highest rate of births per day at 70,000. And my fiance, we've been to the or orphanages in Chennai, Mumbai, Delhi. We've seen the babies and how they fight to live. Every single one of them is a miracle. And I truly believe that each one of you are a miracle, but it raises the question, are we living like one? And when I say are we living like one, are we committing to being the best version of ourselves? Are we focused on innovating ourselves to be a miracle, not just for ourselves, but for, but for someone else? For example, Jeff, what do you mean by an everyday miracle? What do you mean by living to your maximum potential? I think about a little boy who grows up five years old from New York. His mother is holding him. He doesn't know it at the time. He's only five, but his mother is drug addicted, AIDS infected. She literally dies while holding him. This young man grows up, bounces around from household to household, never really knowing who his family is, never really knowing what his roots are. So he reads and he reads and he reads and he starts to develop and learn new ideas, expand his perspective. And just like the traditional definition of innovation, he applies these new ideas and these new insights to his own life. I'm proud to call that gentleman a great friend of mine. He's grown up to become an educator in New York, in Ghana, where he helps the youth, the next generation, create healthy life choices. He has completely innovated himself. He has put the work in to become the best version of himself. And he's not just a miracle for himself. He's a miracle for every child that gets to have him as an educator. 
and the parents of all of his students will attest to that. I think about the young woman who reached out to me on Everyday Power blog, who's gone from abusive relationship to abusive relationship, and she's fed up. She said, Jeff, I'm fed up, I'm tired, I'm ready for a change. I know my value. I'm tired of settling because I had a negative self-image. I'm tired of getting caught up dealing with negative people. I'm tired of it. But I can't just, Jeff, I can't just keep this message to myself. I've got to share it with the world. And so I said, Marie, so what is it that you want to do? She said, I want to write a book, but I'm scared. I can't write a book. And I said, what do you mean you're scared? What are you scared of? I'm scared of what my mother might think. I'm scared of what my community might think, what my family might think. They might think I'm shaming them. People who don't know me might criticize me and judge me for decisions I made in the past. She had to develop the confidence and the self-worth that her message was important. And she wasn't going to let it die with her. She was going to bring it to life. And she did just that. And now her book serves as a miracle for other women, inspires other women. And she gives women's leadership trainings now in Cameroon. Just like the innovations we saw before, she would have never seen her life to go on this direction. But she put the work in to become the best version of herself. And now everybody that meets her benefits, benefits. So I've learned from my own life, the people I've worked with, having the, being blessed to have the opportunity to travel the globe that there are tr three things I believe, three things I truly believe that we can all do to become the best version of ourselves, to really be who we're capable of becoming and maximize our potential. And when we do that, we live our miracle, and we can become a miracle for someone else. The first thing is honor our life. I remember when I was young, I grew up in a biracial household. My father black, my mother white, raised Jewish. I didn't look like either one of my parents. I would go to school, I would do anything to fit in, so I settled to be the class clown. And I was really, really good at being the class clown. I was so good at being the class clown that I did it from kindergarten all the way to college. I was so good at being the class clown that when people would look at their schedule in the beginning of the year, they would say, I hope I'm in Jeff's class because he disrupts the beginning, middle, and the end of the lesson. I hope. He's a lot of fun. I hope I'm in his class. But I didn't honor my life. I kind of just saw my life as... This is what I have, this is who I am, but I didn't see it as the most valuable thing on the planet. I didn't see myself as this is my one shot to be everything I want to be, do everything I want to do, and help as many people as I want to help. I didn't truly honor my life. I kind of just took it for granted. I was kind of just going with the flow. And once I learned to honor myself, honor my life, I didn't waste time. I didn't hang around with negative people. I didn't get caught up in complaining and gossiping and just small stuff. I truly focused on becoming the best I could be. Second thing, a sense of mission. And I love, to talk, I love talking about mission to new graduates, high school students, university students. Because a lot of people, as you know, all the parents in here, raise your hand if you're a parent, please. And I remember when my father used to ask me, so Jeff, what is it that you want to do? I would just look at him and smile and say, I don't know. He would say, Jeff, just make something up. Just, you know, come on, just give me something here. Just make something up, right? And he would ask me again, so Jeff, what is it? What do you want to do? I said, Dad, you know, I love you and all, but you just asked me last week. I, I don't know. I still don't know. And it's very important to realize that we don't need to have our whole entire lives figured out, mapped out, planned out to help somebody right now. We don't need to have a concrete plan for ourselves to make a positive impact right here in our own lives and in the lives of others. And that's how you develop your sense of mission, by working with others, by serving others. Three, the third thing is stay close to your bliss. What is it that truly makes you come alive? You know, I told you the story about how I was always a class clown. And now how, how I interpret that now at the age of 30 from when I was 10 is that I loved lighting people up. I loved making people feel good. And now it's gone into educating people, empowering people, 
inspiring people, motivating them to do what they're truly capable of and moving as far away from average as they can. And, that's, and that lights people. I still get the same thing. P people, oh my God, I didn't know I could do that. And then they do it. And I think that we all have that in us. I think our bliss whispers to us. I think many times we have to look back. I love when Steve Jobs said, you can only connect the dots by looking backwards. And I think that's very true. What is your bliss? Have you allowed the trials and the tribulations to distance you from it? What will it take to get closer to it? Are you around people who support it? Do you have that kind of environment? What is it that truly turns you on? Will you have the courage to pursue it? Because it's really a game of courage. You all are a miracle, each and every one of you in the room. The greatest project you will ever work on is yourself. You are a miracle. Now go out there and live like one. Thank you very much.